Hello, my name is Chrissy Hodges and I am going live here to you to Facebook and later will be posted on my YouTube channel. My name is Chrissy Hodges. I am a mental health advocate, particularly for OCD or pure OCD, peer support specialist where I provide support by using my live experience and I also do referral consultations worldwide to help connect people to resources and therapists uh, in regards to OCD. Oh, and I'm the author of Pure OCD, the invisible side of obsessive compulsive disorder. So if you want to know what this is, you want to know at my experience, go get it. It's good, I think. I mean, it's my life story, so I think it's good. <laughs> Today, um, I well, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, second of all, if you are on my YouTube channel and you're watching this, um, I'm no longer using the treatmentforocd.com website. I'm only using ChristyHodges.com. So if you want to know more about me or set up a, an appointment for peer support or consultation, please head to ChristyHodges.com and contact me there uh, and we can get something set up. So today I'm going to talk about something I've wanted to talk about for a long time and that is real world OCD. Um, so that's actually not just a... It's, it's not like a theme, like an actual theme or anything that people talk about, but what I wanted to talk about is when OCD or symptoms of OCD infiltrates problems that you have in real life and talk a little bit about my experience and, um, you know, some of the things that help me when this happens. So what does that mean? What I mean is when you're experiencing an everyday problem that most people have and most people in life run into, which is a real world problem, what to do when OCD infiltrates that problem, meaning you're experiencing anxiety and symptoms around it or OCD takes hold of it and injects it with, you know, with a steroid and all of a sudden it's out of control. And so, it may not make sense, so I'll just give you an example. So for me, and this is this is what's been the difficult part of when this happens. So I have lived majority of my life with sexual violent intrusive thoughts. Okay, so these thoughts to me are irrational. Even though when I am in it and I'm experiencing the thoughts, they feel so real, it is unimaginable. And I am questioning all over the place if the thoughts are real and am I a monster and why would I think these and there must be some reason why I'm thinking them and all that stuff. Okay, so I am not discounting that. However, I have had OCD long enough that when I get these thoughts, I think to myself, okay, okay. So I feel like this is probably OCD because I'm, you know, it's of a violent nature or it's a sexual intrusive thought. So that's kind of out of my realm of, of desires, wants, needs, things like that. So I can easily identify that it is, even though it may still feel horrible. Now, what has happened to me lately, especially in the last few years, because OCD is a sneaky, tricky beast, is all of a sudden I will get kind of this real world issue, a real world problem. It seems to happen recently lately because now I'm over 40 and a lot of things are starting to fall apart. <laughs> like body wise and everything else. So what happens is I notice OCD and my OCD symptoms and the way that I am interpreting signals for my brain because of OCD latches on to these things. And so what happens is a real world everyday problem can all of a sudden turn into a life or death situation. I need to make a decision now. Oh my goodness, the whole world is going to end. And, you know, what if I make the wrong decision and then, you know, I can't handle it and life is over and all of this. So you may know exactly what I'm talking about. So this is the same feeling because OCD is OCD. It does not matter. This is the same feeling that you're going to get when you have OCD or oh, I'm sorry, um, OCD with extreme you know, violent sexual thoughts that you can kind of identify as these are irrational, but the same things are happening, the same symptoms. So you probably know if you've experienced both or if you're just experiencing this, along with this, the OCD symptoms, when you're dealing with a real world problem, you're going to be ruminating, maybe even avoidance, reassurance seeking. I mean, come on now, Google. Uh, and, and also going to people who may have experienced that same problem. Oh, slippery slope. And trust me, I'm sitting here like talking to myself because I do this as well. But the symptoms almost increase because you can talk to people about it. 
and you can get everybody's opinion about it and you can go to WebMD all day long and find out anything you want to know and you don't want to know to make this thing worse, right? So an example of this um, would be recently probably one of my biggest OCD lapses was last year when I was injured and I actually did a video right after it. Um, I was injured and it was Morton's neuroma. So what this is, is it's a nerve in your foot and it's because of bad form or whatever else, an injury I'd had. And so instead of a normal reaction, like a lot of people have, which may be sadness, excuse me, maybe sadness, irritation, annoyance that they have an injury, you know, and okay, well, I need to figure out what I need to get done for this. Okay, my world went from, oh my gosh, I'm injured to, oh my gosh, I don't want to live anymore because I'm never going to be able to walk without pain. Now, yes, we all have extreme thoughts every once in a while, even if you don't have OCD, but this got so incredibly bad that I was 24 seven ruminating about it. I mean, 24 seven, I couldn't sleep. I would wake up. The first thing I would think about is that. And then I would experience this huge letdown, this loss of hope. You know, I'm reassurance seeking all over the place asking people, I even, sorry, Facebook, I even threw it out on Facebook and a lot of y'all answered, but thank you anyway. And you know, the reassurance helped temporarily, <laughs> but I did everything and anything until finally I went, oh my gosh, this is OCD injecting that steroid into what a normal real world problem is. And I wasn't able to recognize it. Why? Because just like any other OCD fear, it feels so real. And so when it is infiltrating a real world problem, it adds such, such a layer of urgency. I need to solve this because this has to do with my life and my productivity and my children or my family or whatever it is in your life that all of a sudden that you feel like it's going to affect. So this is tricky. Um, what I wanted to say is, oh, and, and so an, a comment that comes up a lot with this is, well, if your experience, if, if OCD can infiltrate everything, which is scary, sorry, but it's true. And I, you know, I live it, so I'm right there with you. If OCD can infiltrate anything and everything, then how do you know when to trust your gut? The answer is never. No, I'm just kidding. That's not the answer. <laughs> sometimes I think that's true because sometimes I don't know what my gut is and what it's not. And this is such a hard thing to decipher for those of us that have OCD because we say, oh, well, I'm going to trust my gut on this. But then all of a sudden, everything in your being is pulling you in a different direction. Not to mention, you may have groinal syndromes and urges over here and every other possible physical symptom where you're going, if this is my gut and everything else is telling me that it's not, how can I trust things? The answer is I don't know. I know for myself and I have come up with some tools on how to figure that out. Now, in the example of my last one, it did get to the extreme, which is some of my mental health symptoms are I start to feel suicidal and depressed. Now, whenever I'm feel, having suicidal thoughts, yes, I usually wake up and go, oh no, that must mean something is really wrong. I need to step up my game. I need to call my therapist. I need to do X, Y, and Z. I don't like it to get to that point. I don't like it when, I, nobody likes it when it gets to that point. I try to take steps before I get there and some of those work and some of them don't. But what I really want to emphasize here is this, and this is going to go along with the self-love and then I want to go into something else that is detrimental um, for this type of OCD or this theme, is oftentimes we live with OCD for decades or years or decades before we even know we have OCD. For many of us, it starts in our childhood. For many of us, it starts in our teenage years. Well, these are still crucial years of brain development. Okay, these are crucial years of social development, of doing what we can to survive social elements in school or, or what have you or wherever else, but also how we problem solve, how we relate to the world. Now. Then let's talk about when this OCD beast is dropped on top of us. I mean, how can we really develop normal 
reactionary skills in the real world when we really are constantly just surviving this illness before we learn that we have it and we're learning to manage it. So the biggest skill that I use when this happens, because it always creeps up on me when I get themes related to real world and trips me up. And I have, when I finally remember it, I have to do this first and foremost. foremost. I have to give myself some love and compassion. Now that's the hardest thing for us to do. Why? Because sometimes we hate ourselves and sometimes we hate OCD and sometimes we wish we were someone else and we wish life could be different. So it's hard to be able to have empathy for ourselves. But here's the thing. If you are here and you are watching this, you more than likely have OCD, which means you have suffered, which means you have gone years surviving this illness, doing whatever it takes, whatever it took to be able to survive. And for many of us, we know those are some dark, long, lonely nights at times, okay? So when things like this creep up and I get tripped up by OCD, I really do try to remember. I have been a victim of this illness I was a victim for a very long time. I had no idea what it was. My brain developed in order to survive. I cannot expect myself to be 100% on guard all of the time, <laughs> you know, constantly cracking the OC whip. Because some of these behaviors, some of these reactions and responses, sorry, they are ingrained in how I respond and how I react to the world. My job I see now is even though sometimes it takes going all the way to feeling suicidal and then going, okay, that's right, okay, I can do something about this. My job is to say, all right, I learned this lesson. I saw that this happened. Now what do I do? So on to what do we do? What do I do when I don't know whether to trust my gut or I don't even know what my gut's telling me because I'm being pulled in a thousand directions. The first thing is this. We, when you're experiencing OCD that's latching onto real world problems, our first inclination is to go, well, what is normal? What is normal? Because it seems like if we could just figure out what normal is, then maybe that means that we could figure out whether we're off a little bit or how to get back on track with normal. Well, here's, I mean, I'm just going to tell you the reality. There is no normal. To any problem whatsoever we are unique individuals we create our normal that is what it is it is detrimental to compare and I'm gonna tell you when it comes to OCD it is the wrong thing to compare why this word should should it is the worst word in the history of OCD because once you start asking what's normal, then you start thinking, well, that's what I should do. That's how I should feel. That's what I should be doing. I'm not doing that. Maybe, maybe that means that I'm not doing something right. Oh my gosh, does that mean that these thoughts are real? Oh my gosh, I gotta get to normal. How do I get to normal? Because I should be doing this and I shouldn't be doing that. And all of a sudden you go down this horrible rabbit hole of shoulds. So asking people what normal is, is really setting yourself up to fail. It's setting OCD up to win. OC is going to be like, oh yes, we have a baseline now. And how in the world can I pull this person up and down? It doesn't matter in what spectrum. How can I pull this person on whatever extreme to screw you up? I was talking to a client the other day. We were talking about this very thing. So if you're watching this, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And I, we were talking about once we start going down the should avenue and we start asking people what's normal, I, I was like, oh my God, that just, that just rolls up. That just rolls out the red carpet down the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> we cannot resist that red carpet down the rabbit hole because you see normal and you're like normal and you like start chasing it. And the next thing you know, you are completely in the dark and that person's normal. You can't even find them anymore. It doesn't even matter. So, I know it's tempting, trust me. And then you're going to want to WebMD stuff, and then that seems normal. But I'm telling myself, I am asking you now, 
Put the keyboard down. <laughs> Stop asking your friends what normal is because it is just going to get us in more trouble when it comes to real world problems. So OCD is OCD. It doesn't matter if OCD latches onto this real world problem or if OCD is latching onto something that you in your mind can think, I know I don't, I know I'm not attracted to my dog. <laughs> but I, like every time I look at my dog, I get the groin up. Like, I, I know that's not true. I know it has to be OCD, but I still can't stop thinking, what am I gonna do? Okay, so there's the irrational versus rational. It doesn't matter. OCD is OCD. It is not about the theme. It's just about the anxiety. And are you doing compulsions to relieve that anxiety? Because that's what you need to pay attention to. And that in itself is something that has helped me through the years with this real world kind of thing. First of all, I try to identify what is going on when it comes to a real world problem and all of a sudden I find myself stuck for days and days and days, I find and like I start to recognize what my body feels like. Okay, what my mind feels like. Do I have a headache right here? Does this crinkle right here get like way more pronounced? I mean, I know I'm getting old, but like, does it get way more pronounced? Are my shoulders hurting? Am I sleeping? You know, are you know, am I tight in certain places? There are things that you can start to recognize to show you whether or not you're having symptoms or not. And that is up to you. This is your pattern. We have to recognize our patterns when it comes to anxiety. When I am experiencing this real world problem, which everybody in the world has, y'all. Everybody has real world problems. But when OCD infiltrates it, there is an urge. There is an urgency. I have got to solve it now or else. Am I right? It is this, oh my goodness, if I don't know the answer, then something bad is going to happen. Whatever that is. That urgency is still there. So look at the terminology. Urgency. Urge is right there in the middle or at the beginning. If you are experiencing some urge and an urgency to, I have to solve this problem or else. Now, if you're waking up and your house is on fire and you're like, well, I have to solve this problem right now or my family's going to die, that's a little bit different. But if it's a, did I leave the stove on? And I need to check it a hundred times and I have this urgency or my family's going to die. There's a big difference in those two. Understanding that difference is crucial. What's driving you in that urge? What is driving that urgency and recognizing it when it's happening? When we think about addiction, and I'm not comparing OCD to addiction, but I am comparing doing compulsions almost in an addiction capacity. There is an urge. I have got to do a compulsion or I cannot maintain while I'm sitting in this anxiety. I've got to do the compulsion. And your brain that is infiltrated by OCD is going, you better do it or something bad's going to happen. You better do it. Here's the thing. You can resist the urge. You can resist it. You could even like, you could even resist it for 10 minutes. You could say, well, I'm just going to stop and I'm not going to act on it for 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, you're pushing back on OCD. Then do you do a compulsion? Okay, then you do. Okay, whatever. But still, recognizing it's an urge. Recognizing it's the urgency. Now, I know many of you are watching this and you're like, well, what do I do if I get the urge? I feel an urge when I'm having violent intrusive thoughts. What if I get the urge? It's the same thing. You know you're not going to act on it. You know, I'm sorry, that was reassurance. But you know what I'm saying. Like, we do things to make sure we don't act on it. Correct? Meaning compulsions. <laughs> So, another thing is just sitting with that urge, letting it pass, letting it be there, sitting in the anxiety, showing your brain, I can have this urge and I'm not doing anything anyway. For me, I recognize the urge. When urgency hits, I have to do this right now. I'm thinking, um, uh, okay, something is weird here. Because in normal life, yeah, I may have problems arise. I may think about them for a while. I may get anxiety about it, but I don't have this need of if I don't act right now, the world is going to burn. That's one thing that I do. Another thing is I recognize all of my patterns of behavior. Okay, am I ruminating 24-7? Am I avoiding certain things? Am I on Google for eight hours a day? Am I contacting every person that I know in the planet that might understand this and getting their advice? 
okay, because if I am doing this and I'm doing it compulsively and it is taking up a lot of my day, boom, there's my pattern. And OCD is about patterns and recognizing that and being able to break them. And then lastly, I, and I mentioned this before, I practice self-love. I practice self-compassion because I think, and I think that y'all know this, half of the battle for this is being able to just forget, I hate that, you know, I hate that terminology, but in this context, but forgive our own brains for thinking and experiencing the things that we do. Our brains can't help it. We can't help it. This isn't something that we asked for. This isn't something that we want, and most of us wouldn't wish this on our worst enemy. I guess depending on your enemy, I don't know. But understanding that this isn't who you are and what you desi desire. This is OCD is ego dystonic. That is what makes it so complicated. We know it doesn't align with our needs. It no, we know it doesn't align with our desires, our wants, but we can't stop. So have some love and compassion around that part. This is not your fault. This is not what you asked for. This is not what you want. But we are here and we are in this together. And there are key ways of being able to learn this and move on and manage it. And one of those is learning to love who you are and having compassion for that part of the brain that is broken and continually working side by side with that brain to help figure out how you can manage it and live a life with it. The last thing I want to say is when I am having an OCD real world issue and I, or a real world issue, I'm not sure if it's OCD and I think, and, I, and I'm going through everything, I'm recognizing patterns but it still, still feels so real and I'm still thinking, I don't know what my gut decision is. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. What, probably the biggest thing that I do is I apply my ERP strategy, or my, my strategies with ERP first is resist any urge to do anything because that is pushing back on OCD number one. So I resist making any decisions at all. And then number two, when I choose to make a decision, which hopefully I've waited a day or so, <laughs> when I choose to make a decision, just like ERP with any other type of OCD, because OCD is OCD, I take the risk and live with the uncertainty. Maybe I'm making the wrong decision. Maybe I get hurt because of this decision. Maybe someone else does. Maybe maybe it's the wrong, it's, it's, it's a mistake, and maybe I've changed my whole life, but either way, OCD wins if I don't make a decision, if I don't take the risk and live with the uncertainty. Because that is what we have to do with OCD. I just posted something on Instagram, and please follow me on there. It's pure o Chrissy. Freedom lies in the gray area, and we exist in the black and white often. It is either extreme this way or extreme that way, and the middle feels dangerous, and it feels terrifying. Because OCD tells us the middle is an answer that you're not gonna like, but the gray area is freedom. And that freedom comes with taking the risk and living with the uncertainty. Leaving you a message tonight, real world OCD, number one, OCD is OCD, it doesn't matter. But it is an issue, especially after you have experienced some of these more, I, I know that this is irrational types of fears, um, but it still feels so real and I'm scared. When it, when it infiltrates the real world, it can feel really scary and it can start to doubt everything about yourself. Know your pattern. Resist asking what's normal. Resist the shoulds. Take the risk. Live with the uncertainty. But most importantly, please seek out therapy, medication, or both. These are the th tools and the things that are going to help you learn to manage OCD every day and be able to live a life while you have OCD that is productive and that you can, you can begin to love. And please love yourself. My name is Chrissy Hodges. Thank you for being here. I'm at ChrissyHodges.com. I'm the author of Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. If you're looking for peer support or referral consultations, please reach out on my website and I will do my best to accommodate that. Have a wonderful weekend and I will see you next week.